Well, it's been a busy week. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson legislating to undermine the Brexit withdrawal agreement, leaving cert results were out, COVID numbers were up and preparations underway for a new plan to handle the pandemic. Joining me in our Leinster House studio is Sandra Hurley of our political staff and our political guest this week is People Before Prophet TD Richard Boyd Barrett. If we get stuck into it just um, on COVID... And we've got plans. Why have we got plans? Because we're scheduled to have a big announcement on Tuesday. But is there any info, Sandra, we might know about what's going to happen and be contained in the plan? Yes, well, big push from government, I suppose, to announce this plan next week, this medium term strategy on living with COVID. We've been promised it for quite some time. The Cabinet Subcommittee is meeting today, the Cabinet Subcommittee on COVID, to consider this, to finalise some of the details, and then it'll go to Cabinet again on Tuesday. But what we're hearing is that there's going to be a kind of a graded system of grades going from about one to four or five, one being normal, five being the most severe, and that that will be done on sort of a national basis. You know, Ireland could have an overall grade, but there will also be grades per county it could be done by area, by region, and that will allow them to kind of calibrate the restrictions. So in the case of a five in a particular area, that might be a form of, you know, a lockdown like we saw before in the absolute strictest sense, or they could divide up the country in other ways and there might be restrictions on the number of people who can come over to your house and the, the way you can socialise, say, at an event or something like that. So that is the, the main part of it. Also, they're looking at travel. It seems pretty clear now that the government is going to opt into this European Commission plan on travel. This also is kind of a coded system. They want to coordinate travel across Europe where countries and even regions within countries would be uh, coloured either green, amber or red. It's kind of obvious, um, you know, green being the lightest. And then if you were, you, you can travel freely to a green area, there'd be no restrictions on coming back. But red, there'd be perhaps a form of quarantine. So this sort of signposting that you're talking about, if it comes to pass, because it still has to go through Cabinet, would seem to be trying to lay out to the public that it becomes more clearer that if we hit three in, say, a certain county, let's take Donegal, then there's going to be a certain restriction and you're going to know what that means. Is that the idea of trying to get away from some of the more mysterious decisions were taken by um, groups and individuals behind closed doors? Is that the good Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, explaining to people why decisions are taken, the main criteria would be, say, the incidence rate per, you know, 100,000 over 14 days. We've seen that number. Also, the ICU admissions and the hospital admissions. We're not clear yet on exactly how much detail we'll get. You know, would they give us a number, say, that if the incidence rate reaches this number in a particular county, then you move to level three? We're not quite clear if they're going to make it that explicit, but the idea is certainly to help bring people along and explain why restrictions are being put into place. How important is it, um, from your point of view, Richard, that the public is able to get a handle on what the uh, consequences are for an increase in numbers when it comes to confirmed COVID-19 cases? I think it's absolutely crit- critical to have public buy- buy-in and understanding. And I, I you know, it's it's something that I've been concerned about right from the beginning. I mean, when you had a general lockdown, then, OK, there was just, you know, it was everybody in it together, yeah. to use that phrase. But from the beginning, there's been a problem in terms of getting the rationale, the exact uh, considerations of the expert advisory group to NEFIT, which they don't publish the minutes. They're about three months behind. And you were leading the call on that way back in, in May and April and we once got, again to try and get the inform- we, information out. Absolutely. We got multiple commitments and still the minutes for these things uh, are, are only going up to about June in the case of the expert advisory group up to early August for NEFIT. It's crazy. So we need clear rationale for things. I also am not sure although I'll listen to see what they say, but I'm not sure if geographical information and sort of approaches are necessarily uh, enough. I mean, to me, there's big question marks over the inconsistencies between our attitude, for example, to meat plants, where we don't want to... It seems the government doesn't want to really go in hard to find out what's going on in the meat plants, where you have high levels of transmission, and then, you know, references to young people or uh, things happening in people's houses. But we're not actually given the information, the data about this. The data on the on the data hub of the HSE 
is very minimal in its information. And I deeply worry about that it, because either they're not telling us the information and they know it, which is not good if that's true, because I think that leads to confusion, or worse, maybe they don't know it because the tracing regime is not sophisticated enough to really track yeah. what this household and community but, transmission is. I mean, the government has had a difficult week when it comes to meat plants and testing, and, and we know it, but nonetheless, the, the stated intention is that's something they are going to get on top of. There will be mandatory testing and they're going to hopefully have an answer to it. But just bringing it back to the plan for Tuesday um, and say, for example, the number of COVID numbers are rising in the Dublin area. You are a Dundiri TD. Um, what type of approach do you think would be appropriate? Would it be a citywide um, mini lockdown if there were numbers were too high or if there was a problem in Dublin West or in Dunleary, would you be happy to say, well, my constituency needs to lock down while the rest of the city operates? Well, I think it entirely depends on the rationale. If there's a rationale that makes sense uh, as to doing a lockdown, absolutely. I think people, it's not just me, but I think people in general will go with it if they understand the logic of what's being uh, what's being proposed. But at, at the moment, there's a, a lack of information and clarity as to what the purpose of certain guidelines and measures uh, measures are. So that is my main concern, that these things are fully explained. Uh, we're not getting enough information as TDs, the briefings that we used to have at the CMO and NEFET. I mean, frankly, you guys get more information on the daily press briefings from, uh, the, C uh, from the CMO than we do. Uh, and that's a real problem in terms of getting buy-in, which you need on a cross-party basis, and most importantly, you need uh, on a public basis. There was a sense among some of the politicians, I'm going to come back to you, Sandra, now after this question, that sometimes some of the briefings when opposition parties were being given information, the information was being used for political purposes and not just to be informed. No, I, I genuinely think, I mean, the opposition were very supportive of measures at the beginning and there was a consensus. Uh, but I think that has significantly frayed over the last while. I mean, the briefings stopped, the sort of high-level briefings with the CMO and NEFET and the HSE stopped, more or less. We've had one uh, under, this, under this new government. Regulations are being issued, and we have a major problem with this, which could even have penal consequences, criminal offences, and we're only told about them afterwards, what they are, and many of them make absolutely no sense to people. So, I mean, what you need is really to bring the public and the, the opposition with you by consulting with them so we can approach this in a collective and consensual manner. OK, that's, we're talking about the broad overview stuff and what the plan is going to be, but there are sort of like sectors who are sort of worst mm -hmm. affected or more affected than others. Just on the question of um, places like arts, like um, taxi drivers, we got an indication today from Liv Rad, Corinne Doyle, that the government was aware of this and was looking towards the budget in some way to try and be able to solve it, Sandra. Yeah, we've had a few hints on that. Uh, Catherine Martin also out today, the Minister with, with, with Responsibility for the Arts. She met the arts organisations last week. And I'm told that what they're looking at is kind of twofold. On the one hand, that there's kind of a push on to increase the numbers that can attend various arts events. There's a lot of anomalies in it. You know, you can get more into a theatre than you can into some other events. It doesn't quite make sense in places. And then on top of that, if they can't at times increase the numbers to a really sustainable level, then something in the budget to help offset the massive decline, the huge drop in income that people have had because it's just been wipeout for people in, in music and various uh, parts of the arts like that. And it seems impossible to see when it could fully reopen um, Richard, you've been. This is one of the things you have been bringing up and regularly over the past number of months. The difficulties faced by um, artists when it comes to there two, seems to be two sides. To it. One is the capacity to open up venues safely mm -hmm. and allow sort of the return of performance, whether it's jazz musician or whether it's on the stage. And then the other sector is some form of additional finance, which will help people to get through until that is actually arrived at. So. Where do you stand on those two issues? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's, a, it's about time that the government, because, you know, I saw a debate in this back in, I think it was March or something, uh, where the uh, arts community, through some of us in the Dáil, actually put forward their demands for a roadmap, a clear roadmap as to how there could be some level of recovery, but also that there would be a step-down income support to, to acknowledge the fact that until COVID is gone, they will not be able to earn and operate at full capacity. And therefore, you need an income subsidy, which is a floor below which you can't, you, you can't fall, but which uh, above which you can earn something, right? A step down payment effectively. And that's not just for arts, music and entertainment. 
Uh, but it's also for people like taxi drivers who are also very much affected by the restrictions, less numbers in tours and less numbers at gigs and theatres and all that kind of stuff, who also, you know, they want to return to work, uh, but the work available to them is a fraction of what it was before. So for both these cohorts and one or two others, we need an income, a step-down income subsidy. Now, there's some positive signs from the government, but they still haven't done it. So, uh, you know, I hope they'll do it. I know the taxi drivers are doing a big drive by pro protest on Tuesday. Uh, there's some events being organised by some of the music and events people, I think, for Wednesday to highlight uh, their plight. And I'm very much supportive of those demands. And I hope the government will respond because th these are people who've done their bit, but have been disproportionately impacted by public health measures, which they've complied with. And can you tell us more a little bit about the taxis? Because remember when you were speaking the Doyle on this issue, you raised the fact that for many of them, they were of an older age cohort. And so there wasn't just the loss of income, there was also the health consideration um, working in such an environment as well. Yeah, well, absolutely. The, the, the older cohort, if you were beyond 66, the pension age, uh, most of them continued working because they were denied the PUP payment, which I think is terrible because they were the most vulnerable group. Uh, and we appeal to the government to extend the PUP payment to them so vulnerable people could, uh, you know, not work during that period. So I think that was very retrograde by the government. Uh, and now they're caught, as are the arts people, between a rock and a hard place because if they stay on the PUP payment because either because of health concerns or because of the little work that's out there for them, their PUP payment is about to be slashed on September the 17th. But if they go back to work, they lose all their PUP payment, but there's a tiny fraction of the income available available to them uh, in their employment. You know, yeah. that's true for musicians, it's true for uh, artists, and it's true for taxi drivers. So all of them need to have some kind of package of support. And when you consider the billions that have been given to other industries, often very profitable companies benefit from the wage subsidy scheme, why can't artists, musicians, taxi drivers, and other affected cohorts get the same kind of well, support? As we said, Leo Vraco was very clear that he heard of this problem, that he was dealing with ministers, Donoghue and McGrath, to ensure that some form of payment would, well, not payment, he said, some form of assistance that the budget will be able to provide for those people so as you say you'll judge them on the basis yeah, well, of I what got you a see. Call, in fairness I got a call from Pascal Donahue's office during the during uh, the August holidays and yeah. they said listen we heard the points you made uh, and we're, we're coming up with something so I just hope that something comes okay. quickly and we'll actually help along with the people who are affected. Okay tens of thousands um, of 18 year olds and 19 year olds leaving cert got the leaving cert results on Monday they're going to get their CAO offers on Friday they're going to find out exactly what their teacher thought of them and the um, uh, the grading that they're going to get next Monday um, uh, the Fianna Fáil had a parliamentary party meeting today among their um, backbenchers there was praise for Norma Foley that it had been a difficult issue she had done well on prime time she had delivered on the um, on the challenge um, even though she was a first time TD so there was a general backing within Fianna Fáil for their education minister. What's your assessment? Well, I didn't see her performance. Uh, and look, it's a huge task and I don't want to underestimate it. Uh, I think there are still some issues that are unresolved. I've had a lot of parents who have underlying conditions who are very worried about their kids going back to school. And we now have 53 outbreaks in schools already. That There are one or two cases in most cases, so we don't know how serious it is. But we need support for parents with underlying conditions who don't know whether it's safe to be sending uh, their kids in. Uh, I, I, and I think more generally, when you look at our class sizes, it highlights that there's an, it's not Norma Foley's uh, problem, but is the problem of successive governments that we have massively overcrowded classes. We need to increase the physical space available in schools. Many of them are in prefabs and so on. We need more teachers. We need to reduce the pupil-teacher ratio so that we can have real safety uh, and better quality education for our young people. Did uh, Norma Foley pull the poison on the question of the leaving cert and the return to school? Is that something, Fianna Fáil, or you get a sense, not just of the parliamentary party meeting, but a wider sense across government that few, that was at least one thing they managed to sort of get over the line? Yeah, I think they were seen as two huge hurdles. We know the return to schools was the one that the government was really concerned about, huge effect for so many people around the country, and generally it has gone pretty well. As Richard said there, there have been, uh, I think, 50 plus schools where there's been a confirmed case but they say most of them have come from the community. It's not spreading within the schools. 
the Leaving Cert has mostly gone OK. There's definitely been some cases where, of course, individuals are not happy. There's two more landmines, though, for them to cross. The CAO offers come out tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. There's huge grade inflation. That means there's, it's going to be high demand for certain courses. Not everybody's going to be happy. And then, as you said, on Monday, people find out what their teacher thought of them. So we are told that there was huge inflation by teachers versus previous years. So there's going to be lots of individuals getting their two grades. And now they're going to be able to compare and they're going to see if they were downgraded. And that's where the problem comes in. There might be legal issues down the line on that. And it still remains a political problem to cross, I think, on Monday. And just one um, last uh, issue um, before we go. Um, People Before Profit is a 32 county um, mm. party. You have um, councillors north of the border. What was your sense when you looked at um, the news and you can see the Secretary for Northern Ireland walking into the House of Commons and saying, yeah, it's true, we're going to break international law? Well, I just think it's extraordinary sort of arrogance. Uh, it smacks of the worst of sort of Tory imperial arrogance that they just think, you know, we can do things that could have very serious consequences uh, for this uh, country and resurrect the possibility of hard borders and so on. Uh, so I think uh, the Irish government have to be very tough uh, and say that, you know, we're not. We consider what you've done completely unacceptable. Or could it just be a trap? The classic negotiation, put up something, trigger a reaction, which serves London and not Dublin buses. Well, we shall see. But I think uh, Boris Johnson, sort of Trump-like, uh, is part of that sort of very nasty, uh, nationalistic, race to the bottom uh, sort of uh, politics, which could be very, very dangerous for this country. And we could end up being a pawn in a game between uh, Boris Johnson's um, <clears throat> what is the, you know, dangerous behaviour and uh, the European Union's desire to protect its single market. And I think we have to say ensuring there is no hard border in the, on this island is our absolute priority and we're not accepting it under any circumstances. But is it even necessarily whiter than white? What was emanating from London was that through some of the negotiations they were getting with Michel Barnier and the EU task force that there were indications that um, the European Union was going to use elements of the withdrawal agreement to impose EU will on the UK even though it had left the European Union and wanted to strike out on its own. So maybe it's 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 not as clear cut as, as we've been saying. Oh, well, listen, absolutely. And one thing we have stressed is that as much as we think Boris Johnson, if you like, is the, is the most dangerous element in this uh, equation and has really little disregard for the Irish situation, I also am concerned uh, that if push came to shove, the European Union might in, indeed exert pressure to protect the single market uh, and require us to, for example, put border controls north and south and some of the conditions it might demand could cause us a problem. And I think the Irish government have to say both to the European Union and to Britain, we're not going to be a pawn in any game uh, and that we're going to put our interests in terms of making sure there isn't a hard border or anything that could resurrect, resurrect conflict on this island or cause major economic problems on an all-island basis. We're not accepting them from either, from either quarter. Richard Barrett of People for Profit, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. We'll catch you again. Um, Sandra, much, if, where do you think this is going to go? We had a very strong statement from B. Hall Martin. The shift now seems to be moving back towards the European modules. Michel Barney in the task force, the Commission President dealing with Boris Johnson. So maybe from an Irish perspective, we can make a stance and demand of what we want to see, but... That's probably as far as it's going to go. What do you think? Yeah, I think the Irish reaction was consternation on Sunday when this was first published, came out in the evening. There was a sense then of kind of wait and see. They hadn't had any, any advance warning. And then on Tuesday, you had confirmation in the House of Commons that, yes, they were going to break international law. And then the full text of the bill yesterday. But I think you're right. Dublin and Micheál Martin have publicly done, uh, you know, made known their feelings on this. Micheál Martin has done a lot of interviews with British media, Sky News and the Financial Times, setting out that this is a breach of trust. Also, of course, with all uh, most Irish media. And there is a sense, however, that it is out of their hands, other than the European Commission completely backing them. You've got uh, the um, Ameri you know, force coming from America in terms of Nancy Pelosi, Richard Neal. That's important as well. But the negotiating from here is out of their hands. They have made their public stance, but it is, it is up to others to see how this plays out. Um, we are just joined in studio now by David Murphy, our political coverage editor. Um, David, one of the things we were talking with Richard Boyd Barrett there was the question of the budget. And we've always felt that when COVID-19 first struck in March, that um, there would be two stages to it. One where everyone was locked down, which was easier. 
And then as they began to open things up, it would become more difficult. There would be winners and losers. And then there would be a finite amount of money that the government give, could give to various different sectors. How do you see the budget coming out? And what are the landmines that are going to be there um, over the coming weeks? So I think one of the big landmines coming up is actually going to be with the banks, because what happened was when um, COVID first arrived in Ireland, immediately um, mortgage holders and businesses were given a six, a six month break, uh, firstly, a three month break in terms of paying their loans, and that was extended to six months. That six months is running out this month. And what's going to happen is that uh, people will be asked to start paying their loans again. And if they can't pay their loans, this is where it gets difficult. So it gets difficult, firstly, for the mortgage holders, because if they can't pay their loans anymore for the first time, it will impact on their credit history and they'll fall into proper arrears. And then for the banks, they will have to classify these loans as non-performing loans. And they will have to begin to try to work on them on a case by case basis and see what people can pay. And we kind of going back into the situation that we had after the financial crisis, where we had a very, very large proportion of ordinary mortgage holders being una- unable to pay their loans. And so I think that there's going to be that crux coming up for mortgage holders. There's going to be a similar crux coming up for businesses, particularly businesses like pubs, like shops and city centres, like cafes and city centres, where they would have seen their turnover fall fairly dramatically. Are they going to be able to pay their loans? And all of this is going to coincide with the situation regarding redundancies. So normally when your job isn't there anymore, you can um, ask your employer to make you redundant and you can get a redundancy payment. Uh, However, the government put a freeze on this during the um, pandemic, but they couldn't extend and they can't extend that freeze for much longer. So many employees will be turning around to their employers and saying, look, you haven't been able to employ, employ me. There's no job for me there. I'm getting estate support. Uh, I think really I need redundancy at this stage. I can move on. You can move on. Let's see what we can do. But many of the employers won't be able to pay. And I think that it could create significant difficulty for those employers. And then on top of that, we've got to see what's going to happen. Richard Boyd Barrett was mentioning there the pandemic unemployment payment. That's going to be tapered down on the 17th of September. Uh, And on top of that, it's going to be closed to new entrants. So you're going to see a confluence of some fairly negative events over the next four weeks just in the run up to the budget. But isn't the answer to that? First, we were going to borrow 10 billion or a deficit of 10 billion, then 20 billion, then 30 billion. And we were heard that sort of some of the income tax was um, staying up or, you know, far more solid than maybe we thought. So surely if we've either got more tax or we're borrowing more money, we're going to be able to solve the problem anyway. So initially during the, I guess, the height of the lockdown, Ireland was looking at a potential deficit of 30 billion euro. Last week, the Taoiseach said it was going to be between 25 and 30. And some of the analysts are now thinking actually it could be 22. Uh, So in other words, the amount we're having to borrow uh, may be a good bit less than we thought. That's the good news. The bad news, though, is that I think the markets are going to cut many of the countries some slack to essentially stimulate the economy. And we've got around 360,000 people on some sort of state support one way or another. Um, If it's a temporary measure and people are going to get back to work, that's considered fine. But if it's indefinite and an individual, their work is not going to be there this year, big question mark over next year and a question mark over what happens after that. Can you continue to leave those individuals on state support or do you need to actually begin to think about saying there are some professions here that are not going to get back to work in the medium term and maybe these individuals need to retrain and do something else. And maybe what we should be doing is targeting some of our resources into job activation measures to train them into new professions. I think that's the conversation that is going to begin to happen around Europe. Like, can you just borrow to give people money continuously? The answer to that, unfortunately, is going to be no. So if the answer is no, um, Sandra Hurley, what happens? You know, from a political point of view, you've got three parties. They seem to be bedding in a little bit better than they have been for the few months. They are moving towards a budget where they know they've got finite resources but massive problems. 
how do you think the coalition is going to try and bridge it when we have an opposition which is clearly um, sort of pointing out all the weaknesses and saying how can you let these people down how can you let cancer services down how can you not provide for disability etc etc how will the government manage yeah, that yeah I mean that, that's the essence of politics making those decisions with finite resources and prioritising and doing what you can and I think you're going to see the Greens under pressure we've seen that the whole time in the doll from the left really targeting the Greens I think about some of the tougher decisions they might have to take I think we'll see more of that in the run-up to the budget. And you might see little jockeying between the parties, the usual kind of ideas floated about who suggested something and whether it was knocked down and one party fighting for something, because it's important in coalition politics that they might have to have those public wins. So I think we're going to see some of that as well. But it does look like a really tough budget. Uh, the spending this year has just absolutely bloomed. And yes, there's leeway in terms of borrowing more, but th there is a limit to, to how much you can do. So we were saying, just looking forward to next week, we've got the Leaving Cert issue on Friday and Monday. We've got a big government um, cabinet meeting on Tuesday with this COVID um, six to nine month plan being launched. Is there anything else we need to be watching out for? That's loads, but is there anything else we should be looking for, forward to in the calendar? Uh, yeah, I think those are the main things so far and uh, more in the doll. The Public Accounts Committee back next Thursday. And I think... That, from a political point of view, that's interesting because the COVID committee we know is going to be kind of phased out, I think, around the end of September. The other committees are all coming back. I think, is it 21 committees? It's a lot going on there. The Public Accounts Committee has always been a powerful committee. It's going to be chaired this time by Sinn Féin's Brian Stanley. And I think they're looking at getting the HSC Paul Reid in first and I suppose examining the financial aspects of that. But that, I, I would imagine, will generate a lot of interest and a lot of news. Yet another busy week. Well, listen, just want to say, I um, hope you enjoyed the podcast. And if you did, please subscribe and leave a review. We'll talk to you again next week. Goodbye.